Kelly Erickson is one of my favorite health practitioner colleagues. I love talking to Kelly because we always talk about trauma and the nervous system. I love Kelly's perspectives. She's got a lot of wonderful information, and I really wanted to talk to her and pick her brain about melanin. In this episode, we talk about a lot of different things, but I was, I'm was i starting to understand more about melanin and the brain and trauma, and so I really wanted to chat with Kelly about that. So we do cover that, but we cover a lot in this episode, and I absolutely love it. My favorite part probably of this episode is where we talk about the light inside of our bodies, and Kelly just says, yes, this is like a light show going on inside of our bodies. Yes, 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 all about that. So I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I enjoyed talking with Kelly Erickson. Kelly, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to talk to you. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kelly. Well, I'm always excited to talk to you, but I think what you have been sharing lately is really exciting to me. So I want to see where we go with this, but I thought we might start because I want to talk about trauma from a quantum perspective. I know you and I talk a lot about cell danger response and cell danger signaling and how that relates to our mental health, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, all of that. So we'll yeah. see where we go. But I thought okay. it might be helpful if we start with a little bit of your story, because sure. I know you and I came to quantum health because of our sons. Right? Yeah. And you and I both have a trauma, trauma in our history and yeah. had done a lot of work personally when we got to this place. So I yeah. think it's really helpful for people to hear the, the parts that were somewhat helpful, but then what quantum health has done for you and your family? Sure. Yeah. So um, I have a pretty significant history of childhood trauma, a um, lot of addiction, domestic violence, poverty, all the things. And, um, uh, you know, just growing up, I kind of then perpetuated that on myself through lifestyle habits and behaviors, actions, all of that stuff. And so, um, you know, I I understood the um, impacts of trauma. And so, you know, I started therapy at a pretty early age. I think it was 11 or 12. Continued oh, to therapy. Yeah, that's very young. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in school, they offered a service where we could um, leave class once a week and go sit in a group therapy session and do all the things. So I participated in that all through school. And then I continued talk therapy until, gosh, it was about 30. And I just wasn't really getting anywhere, not the way I thought I should. So in between, you know, I tried a whole bunch of different things. I tried acupuncture and homeopathy and I mean, pretty much anything you can think of. I tried it at mm -hmm. least a little bit. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't until later when we started to notice some issues, some health issues with my oldest son that I again started diving into the health world and trying to figure out what could help him. And so um, when I would ask him to embark on any journey, I would also do it with him, right. um, you know, just so that he never felt like he was alone or being asked to do something that I wouldn't do. So when we um, came across a doctor that was talking about the ketogenic diet and sunshine, mm -hmm. um, I tried to get him to do it on his own, but eventually I had to step in and do it with him. And for me, it was really just about losing weight. Like I wasn't approaching this from the perspective of like, oh, this could help with my trauma. Or deep um, healing at all. Yeah. It's just like, yeah. this would help me with my weight. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, I don't know, it was probably about six months into it that I recognized something deeper was happening. Like somehow I was working through my childhood trauma and it was hard for me to even put my finger on how that was possible. Like, 
it didn't make a lot of sense to me, but it was happening. I could feel it at a really deep level. And so I got to studying. I went back to school, did all these things. And, you know, I came across some really important research that kind of explained how this, um, you know, getting out into nature, exposing myself to key times of sunlight and, um, and working essentially on the mitochondria, how this really was helping me to dissolve some of my trauma. I do want to say, because I haven't, I don't think I've said this before, all of these practices were really great, but it didn't negate the fact that I still had to do the emotional component. Right. I, yeah. I still had to work on that aspect. Yes. But what I've come to understand now is that in order to work on all of those emotional wounds, that requires a lot of energy. Yes. Not just up here, but your body, it takes up a lot of energy. And if you are already in an energy deficit, you're not going to have the capacity to process these emotional wounds that you're carrying around with you. And so that's what I came to understand is that, um, you know, I really was um, fixing my cellular health and doing all of these things so I could free up the energy to go through the deeper emotional wounds that I was still carrying around. Right. And it's really interesting when the nervous system starts to become more nourished on a cellular level, you start to have more safety signals coming to the mitochondria. Everything's working much better. And then what surfaces to be healed? <laughs> it's yeah. like, oh, and it's not like that wasn't there. It's been there. And it's not like you haven't addressed it or tried to address it in other ways, but now you just have this different capacity to heal at a much deeper level. It's, it's not so overwhelming. At least that's what I felt. Yeah. 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 I mean, I had, I had a lot of stuff to work through, so it still felt very overwhelming at times, Yeah, but not that scary overwhelming, oh. which is where I was before. It was too scary previously to deal with any of it. So this Definitely, like you said, you you provided the safety signaling yeah. for your nervous system, for your cells, for all of it. And so it didn't feel as scary as before. That's so. a good way to put it. Not as yeah. scary. Yeah. 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 So is it mostly, I mean, if you had to put it together when you were first starting, it was a ketogenic diet, which was a huge help for you. So let's talk to people a little bit about exactly what you were doing in terms of key times of sunlight, in addition to the ketogenic diet. Yeah, so I was getting up for sunrise every single day. Uh, I was getting midday uh, light exposure and then watching sunset every afternoon. Um, in the beginning, I didn't understand how important it was to also block blue light in the evening. So, um, you know, the, it, the pieces kind of came, uh, at different times, right. but that's, this is where I started. And, um, and at the same time, I also started doing the ketogenic diet, which, um, you know, when you have a history of childhood trauma, what can happen to our cells is they get stuck in something called the cell danger response. Right. And when this happens, it significantly shifts what's happening in the mitochondria. So it alters the cell membrane that stiffens and prevents things from coming in and out. Um, we see alterations in our redox potential. Um we have a shift towards glycolysis, which means becoming a sugar burner, uh, which explains why you tend to put on weight after significant uh, stress or childhood trauma. Um, so we see all of these changes in the mitochondria that ultimately lead to inflammation. 
Right. Um, but so utilizing the ketogenic diet helped reverse some of that or um, change the course of its direction. And so you have these two pathways in your cells where you can burn fat or you can burn sugar. And so it took a while for me to train my body from going being a chronic sugar burner to being able to burn fat which I later learned that when you burn fat, you make four times the amount of energy. energy. Yes. And, but also you make more of something called metabolic water. And this metabolic water is really, really important because under the right sunlight conditions, it can turn into something called easy water, which acts like this battery mechanism inside of our body that we ultimately charge through the sun. Right. So, and this water is also really important because it acts as a communication pathway in the body that facilitates like almost instantaneous communication throughout the body. Yeah. And so you are just essentially like going from this state of hibernation, that's what your body's doing, into... um like it's springtime again and everything starts to bloom and blossom and open up and um, kind of come back to life. And so that's what I felt happening is like my whole body was coming back to life and I could feel it. Yes. That's what I love. And I love that feeling of coming back home to yourself. Like it's like, it, it that's what it feels like. It feels like, and it's so funny that you're talking about blooming because I've been filming my house things that are reblooming like some orchids oh. and i just it gives me such hope because that's exactly how it felt when i started doing these things i was just trying to get my kid to do them and and then i started realizing wait i am waking up feeling really energized and grounded which i don't think i've felt maybe ever even as a child i would felt very sluggish in the mornings and so just all the things that start to fall into place, because I know you and I then go, wait, why is this happening? How is yeah. this happening? So then we start doing the deep dive into all the research and going down the rabbit hole. And the mitochondria, you figure out that it all comes back to the mitochondria and circadian rhythms, right? And our circadian rhythms, supporting the circadian rhythms, I believe, being in nature, really supporting those circadian rhythms is what brings us back to ourselves and helps us feel a, our right place in nature as part of nature. And in that process, you're also healing on this deep cellular level. So your mitochondria are healing. And yeah, then the exclusion zone water, this easy water that we make inside of us is literally, it's like it's re-lubricating everything. It's rehydrating yeah. everything. So yeah. I love the way that you talk about that because that's that's what happened for me too. And it continues yeah. to happen. Yes. And, and more, I feel like the more that I clean my brain, because um, I kind of had to clean my brain a bit before all this started making some sense. I just had to trust like, okay, the sunlight, fine. I'll just go out at sunrise and see what happens. And then you just start slowly as your brain cleans or you're cleaning your brain or it's cleaning itself through autophagy or apoptosis. Then you start to make, all this starts to make more sense and more pieces come. Yeah. And then it, it starts to click together and it's so exciting because it continues. It's not like a yeah. place you land and end. Yeah. Yeah. That whole process of studying, I've said this before, but like I, it was divine guidance as I would yeah. read something or listen to something, there would be a word or two that would just stand out to me. And so I'd go research that. But it, like you said, my brain wasn't functioning at its best. And so reading it didn't really even make a whole lot of sense to me then either. And yes, it was over time as my brain healed and I made new connections and, you know, that, uh, that whole process of rewiring your brain after trauma can happen so many different ways. But for me, it was studying. It was using parts of my brain that I had not used in so long, you know, and then 
being able to connect that information that I was gathering with actually how I was feeling, again, was another kind of neuroplasticity type thing, things I hadn't ever been able to feel before. And, and then adding in exercise, you know, I started um, running, which I'd always, I'm not a good runner, but Same. I'd always wanted to be a runner. And, yeah. yeah. And so I took it up. And so again, like building these new networks inside of my brain, shuttling out all of this toxins and yuckiness that I'd accumulated over the years. I just felt like a new person, like someone I'd never been before. Yeah. A whole new person. Yeah. I was thinking about this last night when I was thinking about getting to talk to you. And I was like, what divine guidance that we probably, I don't know if we would have come to this on our own for our own health, but because our, our child, we had a child that when we were doing all the things and trying all the things to help them, then, then it brought us to this place, Yeah, but, you know? Um, yeah, it's really fascinating because I've said, you know, in the beginning, I thought, well, I'm here to help this child or guide this child or give this child something that they couldn't have gotten somewhere else. But it turns out, no, it was the other way around. This child was a mirror for me and a guider for me and my healing as well. Yeah. 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 Unbelievable. Um but in the midst of it, it's pretty messy and did not feel good at all. And I just had to keep trusting that there yeah. was some divine plan that I, you know, just put one foot in front of the other and clean your brain so that you could follow the trail. That's, yeah. 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 And it's a mother. It's so hard because we want to like shield them and protect them and fix you know, fix maybe not yeah. the right word but For fix sure. them you know we want to do all of these things but in reality the best thing we can do for them is take care of ourselves and that modeling that behavior is what they really learn from not the words or the things that you know what I mean so them watching us make these huge changes while they may not be inspired to make those changes today themselves it is still a part of their journey and their um, all of these things. And so someday when they decide to take control of their health as well or whatever it is, they'll be able to look back and go, my mom did it. I right. can do it. Right. Yeah. That reminds me of the reblooming. Like at any point, something looks dead, but it could rebloom. So just if yeah. it has the right inputs. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm really fascinated about, let's talk a little bit more about the danger cell, the signaling, because I think safety signaling, I'd like to, for people to hear that there's the other side that when we're doing all of these things that help restore our literal battery, that is our body, that it's all about safety signaling and kind of turning down that danger signaling. Yeah. So through the work of Dr. Robert Navio, we have come across something called the cell danger response. It's this evolutionarily conserved cellular uh, adaptation to when it senses danger. And um, danger essentially is any stressor for the body. This can be psychological or emotional stressors. It could be toxins, heavy metals, infections, right? Anything that the cell perceives as danger is can trigger this cellular response. And it's... Um, it's adaptive, you know, when it first begins, it's, it's something that is beneficial. Um, but in, when we have too many stressors stacked on top of each other before the previous stressor can be resolved, or if one stressor is so significant, the cells can stay stuck in this danger response. And then this is where we see all of the adaptations in the mitochondria that kind of go into this rogue metabolism right. in an attempt to keep you alive. And so we also know from like the polyvagal theory and nervous system 
um, research is that your body kind of does that when you go into fight or flight, right? right. Your digestion shuts down. Like it's, it's going to conserve energy so that you can fight or flee your way out of a situation. Um, and so the cells do this as well. And it's this kind of core uh, coordinated response. It happens at the same time. And the part of the brain that controls this is the brain stem. This is where the vagus nerve initiates. Um, but this is also the part of the brain that controls the cell danger response. And so when we see one, we see the other. And so, um, you know, it's two fields of study but they really overlap each other right and you know if you look at the polyvagal theory it will tell you that stimulation of the vagus nerve improves mitochondrial function and so you know there is this bi-directional relationship that's happening just like everywhere else in the body and so i found that targeting the mitochondria can begin to shift the nervous system right and it is through this safety signaling well safety comes in many different forms and a lot of it may not be things that people think of and so when we look back at our evolution we kind of have to ask ourselves how did we evolve? I mean, even 150 years ago looked very different than how we're living today. Yeah. And so nature really provides all of these safety signals for your nervous system, but also for your cells. And so getting outside and getting proper exposure to sunlight is one of the key foundations for it. And there's so many reasons why, but we'll just stick with the safety signaling. Um, but also like, then you can look at things like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right. that foundation, right? You need clean air, water, food, shelter, blah, 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 right? And this is what we are missing when we just look at one area of um, research is that we have to combine them both and understand that they uh, correlate to each other. And so we need to make sure that people are being properly hydrated. Like when you talk about nervous system health, does that conversation come in very often? Not that I have heard, right. but you need adequate hydration and you need a good foundation of nourishing food. You need proper shelter. But when we think of proper shelter, we think of these homes that have, you know, um, good windows and a good roof and all of that. But sometimes our home can actually be a source of danger for us and not for the obvious reasons like mold or some sort of toxicity, but for other reasons like our exposure to non-native EMFs mm -hmm. or the light that's in our environment. If we have all the windows closed all the time and all the lights on and everything plugged in our house, we're actually interfering with our body's ability to perceive and um, kind of detect what's going on in our environment. It feels right. very chaotic. And yeah. so nature is just this place where our nervous systems evolved and so we need to get back out and connect with that natural environment yep. to provide those safety signals. Right. Yep. That's and years and years ago, I read a book and I kept talking to everybody in the counseling field about this nature de deficit and it was nature deficit disorder. And everyone thought it was the craziest thing, didn't make any sense. And now, of course, it's coming back around what, 15 years, well, usually about 20 years for everybody to catch up to something that's, but it's always about nature. Like that's, that's the best way to return to a lot of safety signaling. Even just images of nature can yeah. help with that. So making just small changes where you're cracking, like I have a window cracked right over yep. there right now. Like Maybe. you just yep. start making these small changes Except I just was laughing because I taken I'm taking the clock out of the bedroom and my husband's like, You're taking the clock now? There's nothing left. And I was like, That's right. 
<laughs> nothing left to plug in up our earthing mat that we sleep on. So I mean, just, you know, it's slowly and you don't have to get really obsessive. I think sometimes we start down this road and people can get really um, worked up about their diet. They can bring more stress to themselves. Like what's going on in my house? Now my my house is dangerous and my food is dangerous. And, and you know, that is not going to help with safety signaling to your body and your cells, your nervous system. So, you know, just slowly finding little things that you can do like you're wearing blue blocking glasses. It took me a while. I probably a solid year of really going outside for sunrise and doing sunset, getting myself out there for my sun sessions and all that before I actually realized you have to block the light at night and getting yeah. the blue blockers. So, yeah. you know, little by little, most of it's free. Like this is yeah. what's exciting. I think, yeah. um, and you're going to buy food anyway. So you might as well start figuring out the food that's going to be best for your mitochondrial health. And so for me, I think I, I love the tool of u- utilizing ketogenic diet, like a nutritional keto- ketosis is very helpful for cleaning the body. And then, you know, just really figuring out what works in your body, what really seems to resonate and paying attention to what is grown in your area. So for the mitochondria, it's more of a seasonal, for me, nutrient dense foods. Um, You know, that's, that's where I've landed. I don't know about you with your clients and where you've landed. Yeah, I use the ketogenic diet as a therapeutic option, right? If we're dealing with something significant, um, even just to get them to kind of begin to shift out of the cell danger response, because like I said, when we enter that, we shift towards glycolysis. And if we can't burn fat, we're, you know, it's uh, uh, like a double-edged sword or a a feedback loop, right? You're going to keep creating this extra inflammation and all of these things. And so I do like to use the ketogenic diet for therapeutic reasons, Um, I don't think that the ketogenic diet is a place that most people should stay. Mm -hmm. There's always um, caveats and some people that is just the way that they do best. Um, But I do think it's important, like you said, to then once you've achieved what you're looking for, that then move towards what is happening in your environment in terms Mm -hmm. of food. Um, And that looks different for everyone. Someone who lives in Florida like you is going to be able to squeeze through the winter probably with some more sugar and carbohydrates that grow in your region than someone who lives in Canada who's got nothing growing in their region in the winter. So, you know, it is different for everyone. And I think that, you know, the food uh, dogma people can get so caught up in it but the truth is you have to listen to you You, and your body yeah and I think a lot of it also comes from your lineage like where does your family originate from yeah you know are you a, a Norwegian and so your body is going to probably like a lot more fat and all of these things because it's colder there or are you from somewhere in South America you know so like there's a lot of stuff going on and it's not just black and white you eat this and you're going to feel your best I agree. I I think the lineage piece, like just ancestrally, it just makes sense because you're also, you're past, you're passing down mitochondria. We're passing down our gut microbiome. And so it just makes sense to me. But I also kind of feel like there's certain things that I think your soul just wants, regardless of what would be appropriate or proper if it feels very comforting and filling to you and you're on a soul level even if it makes no sense to your practitioners or anybody around you I think you gotta listen to that and the cleaner I feel like the more we utilize nature and be and return to ourselves that that re-blooming that happens inside of us then you can hear that a little bit or I don't know that that's necessarily yeah. a hearing it's yeah. a knowing yeah. yeah that those messages get clearer 
because the quantum superhighway that is from this exclusion zone water that you make in your mitochondria that's everywhere in the body that's just instantly communicating all yeah. of that gets so much faster clearer better and and so for me it feels like my soul is happier because yeah. i can hear yeah and when you think about childhood trauma one of the yeah. biggest um impacts is that you disconnect from yourself yes. like you can no longer interpret the signals that are taking place inside of you and so you're kind of on this external journey like looking for validation from other sources and when you clean out from the inside and go back to connecting with nature you rediscover that internal innate sense of intuition or connection to your higher power or God or the ether Sources. or whatever yes. it is. Right? Yes. And so again, just another layer of becoming alive, like you just open up and yeah, feeding your soul that something that it is craving or wanting is different than when you're stuck in that nervous system dysregulation and you're using food as a means to quiet the noise. Very different than once you're in that healing space and you're listening to what the signals are telling you. Like, I really want to make a blueberry pie today and sit down and enjoy and eat it with my family. Sure, it's got gluten and sugar and blah, but that is what can is nourishing, you know? It's it's I don't know. There's yeah. a lot more to yeah. it and we like to try to narrow everything down to one simple answer, mm -hmm. but that connection and community that you get when you eat with other people and eating things that you made and you enjoy and all of that is such a healing component as well. Yeah. And as, as somebody who really has struggled with addiction, I, I find that that the tricky territory because yeah. I've used things to numb in a way that I still looked completely healthy and normal but I could just keep moving the numbing around enough to <laughs> get by. It was, you know, yeah. and so I really, I walk that. I, I, that is also why I love the idea of healing to get to a place where you have that intuition and that, you know, something feels good and healing and a part of your community that you can partake in that. So yeah. that's, yeah, it's really, it's an exciting time. Yeah. I got to ask you about melanin. I'm trying to put the melanin with the PTSD piece. I've got circadian rhythms and yeah. how that impacts understanding of trauma, particularly post-traumatic stress, whether you put the D on it or not. I mean, I'm almost like, is it really a disorder? Because it really feels like it's adaptive. It's your body going into survival mode. Like it doesn't oh, yeah. feel like it's actually a disorder, but you've got this post-traumatic stress and um, it really irks me when, especially clinicians will say, um, they'll ask me something about a client, like gut health related or something, right? And I say, well, tell me about their trauma history. Oh, no, no trauma. <laughs> like, okay, so they didn't have, they weren't born. They didn't have, it's not just the big T traumas. It's also the little T's are the things that might have impacted the stress bucket. And now it's overflowing, right? So- so understanding that circadian rhythms are a big piece of that, but also melanin. So whatever pieces of that you want to take and, and tell me what you have learned, I'm all um, ears. Well, so like just at the very basic level, when you look at the stress response, what you can find in the research is that our sensory organs will detect, they scan the environment mm -hmm. and they detect a threat. They send it on to the amygdala, which then interprets whether it's a real threat and then sends that information back to the hypothalamus, which initiates this stress response. So when we look at these sensory organs, which is our eyes, our ears, our nose, our mouth, and our skin, um, what 
is the commonality in all of these things? Well, we have this molecule called melanin that sits inside of all of these places and acts as kind of an antenna for the environment. It responds to um, frequencies or, um, well, yeah, frequencies, electromagnetic frequencies. Yeah. And so we know from specific research that melanin can be degraded in the eye from chronic exposure to artificial sources of blue light. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I was like, how does melanin fit inside of this picture? Right. Because it just seemed to make sense to me. I, that divine guidance, like uh, it belongs here somewhere. Right. Um, so when you look at the sensory organs, what happens when we're children, you know, and this isn't going to be some big scientific explanation, but this is how I look at it. Perfect. Like what happens when we're children, we have, um, domestic violence in our home, or we witness something, uh, you know, a tragedy, some accident, a death, whatever or we hear what's going on, right? And, and the initial response is to increase um, these sensory abilities, like our sight intensifies, our hearing intensifies, so that we can better detect the danger in our environment. Well, I think after too long of that, um, stress response like it's needing to heighten its responses it somehow also gets degraded mm -hmm. and I mean I was looking at it from the component of like if you you know because PTSD was largely associated with people who went to war combat veterans, veterans. Yep. And when you think about their environment, loud explosions on the ear can ruin the melanin. Um, the flashes of light that they're exposed to from bombs and guns going off can destroy the melanin in their eyes. Uh -huh. And so I was like, oh, this is interesting. But then when I started to think about my own childhood and how... I had to, as a kid, listen a lot to what was going on in another room to yeah. see if I needed to be on alert. And then I found that ear thing continued with me throughout lifetime. You know, if I was in a job setting, I could hear what was going on in another room, right? But, um, and now I have ringing in my ears. And so I'm like, oh, interesting, too much stress on these parts of our um, or, or body that are designed to help us pick up on these danger cues. It degrades their ability to work. And so, um, you know, melanin in and of itself is like this whole big, long story. It's so important in how we um, integrate, perceive, interact with the world around us. Yeah. Um, and it's not just for the sun. It is, in my opinion, how it's similar to the mitochondria, the mitochondria are so important for how we sense and integrate and perceive yes. it, uh, the environment. Melanin is also like that. It plays this really big role in how we interact with our environment. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think melanin plays a big role. And so then that takes you back to the sunlight piece. Well, if we can use sun to help rebuild the melanin stores inside of our sensory organs, but also deep inside of our body, that's another way we can kind of bring ourselves back to life. Exactly. And I am perfect. That was a perfect explanation. That makes perfect sense to me. I was... I kept saying, I know this melanin in the brain, melanin in these places, this is really important piece for mental health. I just, and so you start to to put all the pieces together. And another part of it is infrared light. I think for me getting infrared, specific red light therapy panels, when I started that, because I bought the thing for the kid, the kid wasn't using it. So I'm like, I'm using it. I was shocked at how helpful that was for me. And I was already going outside a lot. And I love that it's free, infrared, red light, 
from dawn to dusk out there. But um, an infrared maybe is there all the time, right? Year round. And this concentrated being in front of a panel really seemed to reduce the inflammation, probably is expanding the exclusion zone water. But I didn't really put it together that it's also probably helping with melanin, but maybe it's only UV light. I don't No, I think um, both the light that the mitochondria makes and the UV light can help us rebuild different aspects of the melanin. You know, we have the external sources and then the internal sources. And so both of those are important components for uh, restoring that melanin inside and out. Yeah. And I yeah. got really obsessed with the, um, I still, I'm just getting really excited about the fact that we make our own light inside of us. Like that is yeah. just huge. Cause I always kind of had, and I didn't really talk about spiritually. I thought about us being light beings. I wasn't really understanding, like we literally make light inside yeah. ourselves. And that yeah. to me is the crux of healing. Yeah. Yeah, it's so fascinating because like you, I would hear people, oh, they're light beings. And I'm like, nah, okay. Um, <laughs> but now, yeah, completely understanding we make our own light, we absorb light, we convert light into energy. Like it is this whole kind of trickery of the mind that we think that we are this mass of being, but it's that the light has slowed down enough to turn us into this mass. And, but there's all of this light show going on inside of us. And what I found really cool is after I quit drinking, when I would go to sleep, I started, it was like there was this light show going on behind my eyes when I would try to go to sleep. I thought it was, you know, whatever, wrote it off. But years later in the research, the, these are actual um, reflections of the light show that's going on in your brain, the neurotransmitters, all of this action that's happening is being reflected behind your eyes. And then I saw it being taken one step further that you can use this light behind your eyes in um, visual imagery to send it to other parts of your body for healing. Hmm. Amazing. Yeah. Crazy. I know. And we've been, I mean, I've been using visualization and all kinds of stuff in my work for years, but not really understanding that it's all about the light. And I was listening, you know, I'm really interested in emotion, right? And how emotion to me is part of the, it's frequency and it's a part of the field. And we can tap in to these different emotions at any time. And when we've had a lot of trauma, that becomes very challenging for us to, to find our own feelings, but it's not like the emotions aren't there and we couldn't tap into them. We just just like a wall that we build up because we're like, not going there because some of it's bad. So I'm not going to, and so when you start to heal and you realize like these emotions are everywhere and then the feeling comes online and then over time you build mood based on these feelings like that to me is but I heard someone say well there's no light in the brain so it's all and I was like okay wake up people like that's so antiquated you don't realize it's all frequency and it's all related to light (laughs) so Yeah. Yeah. It's literally one big light show going on inside of your body from your brain to your cells, to everything in between the bacteria in your stomach are emitting their own light. I mean, it it, it literally is one big light show. Light show, which how fun is the light show? And then to be able to direct that light, direct the light show to places or areas that need healing. How cool is that? And yeah from the inside yeah well and take then one step further I'm reading a book uh by Eileen McCusick and she talks about how when we have significant trauma or events take place in our life that we kind of lose the light into our field and it gets stuck in our auric field um and that 
that we kind of then walk around this is so fascinating she didn't really explain it this way but this is what I've interpreted yeah is then we're kind of walking around with our wounds kind of out Out. and exposed you know instead of uh being protected by our field they're kind of inner field and so then it made me think how we interact with other people yeah and we know that our electromagnetic field stems six feet off of us right and so if we're carrying these wounds all out exposed in the open and then we go and interact with someone and their wounds are all exposed then we're just having this really contemptuous difficult interaction because I do think that interaction or communication there's so much more going on than the words that we're using or our body language like yeah. there's information in our field that's being exchanged. Right. And I think when people say, oh, it's happening unconsciously or subconsciously, what I really think is happening is that it's our field. It's in the field. And I yeah. just thought, okay, so first of all, I just have to reach over here and show you what I've been oh, reading this that's, week. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm reading. Yeah, Electric yeah. Body, Electric Health, and I'm rereading it. And it's so funny because I'm like, did I read that the first time? Because it sinks in in a way. And a lot of it has been like, oh, whew, because my own wounds, like I'm able to really look at those wounds. But it, to me, it's like our wounds are greeting each other before yeah. we. And so the, and I used to say this to my my graduate students in counseling all the time. The more healing you do, the more energetically you're whole then the more people you're going to be able to help because you'll be an energetic match. It's more about the match. And they used to look at me like I was absolutely insane, but it's all about the healing and the frequencies and these places where we're, you know, what Eileen talks about where we're stuck or where I might say we're weak in those areas. That's not like the full spectrum of light that's in the auric field whatever, however you look at it, where it's kind of stuck or it's not getting the juice that it needs to heal. And then that's what we're putting out there. That's where we're greeting each other. Yeah. Which then, yeah, when you think about it from that perspective, it kind of explains what's happening in the world and how everybody is so mean to each other and short-sighted and low patience and all of these things. It's like, you're just operating from the space of woundedness instead of this whole integrated light beam that you are. It's, and emotions are so like when we carry them and we don't process them, it's so heavy and dense. You feel like you weigh a thousand pounds carrying all of that around. Yeah. Yeah. (sighs) I know. I agree. And for me, I I don't know about you, but when I started utilizing a ketogenic diet and for me, I went like a high fat carnivore really felt very healing to me. And as I started shedding it, just the weight was shedding, but I felt so much more emotionally lighter and more available to do that work. Yeah. So that's how it felt for me. Yeah. Some of those emotions were less weighty literally yeah 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 Yeah. I mean and then you can look at research and they say that memory gets stored in the cells or memory gets stored in the fascia or memory gets stored in water Water. Mm -hmm. and I think it's kind of a combination of all of it right because pretty we're Mm -hmm. what 99 percent water like when you go deep inside of everything um or you can look at it from the other's perspective they say we're 70 percent water either way we're a lot of water right and you know that water is carrying memory Memory. or frequency of information and so when we enter something like the ketogenic diet and we start making more metabolic water we're using that water to push out the old stagnant energy and old water Um, And replacing it with this new, higher frequency, more energetic water. Again, facilitating movement of emotions. Amazing. Yeah, Yeah. I know. And anytime, I'm glad that we started with emotions and we're ending with emotions because I just think it's helpful to drive it home that 
there's always, if you have physical issues, there's an emotional component. And if you're not addressing the psychosocial, emotional, and spiritual parts, and you're just trying to come at it from this physical, you're missing a large part of what's actually happening. And that's never going to, in my experience, that has never been a cure or a, you know, it's not going to fix things to where you're fully restored just by coming at it with like your thoughts and, and physical stuff. We got to include all of, especially the emotional piece. Yeah. And I love that because I think more and more people are coming around to the concept or the idea that we are mind, body, and soul. And we absolutely have to address all three components when healing from anything. You can call it childhood trauma, or you can call it chronic fatigue syndrome, or you can call it um, fibromyalgia. All of them, you can look in any of the research, and they all have roots in childhood trauma. So it's your emotions. You have to address them. Right. I would even like in thyroid, like every, all the things that we start trying to, because yeah. your body's trying to communicate with you. And yeah. then, yeah. And so reducing the chaos, increasing the coherence, that's, yeah, it's all frequency. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything we didn't cover, Kelly, that you were like, oh, we need to cover? No, I don't think so. I mean, I could sit and talk about this forever. So really, uh, no, but uh, no, I think that's a, a pretty good broad overview and of how the cell danger response overlaps with the polyvagal theory, which overlaps with um, quantum biology or quantum health, right? They all go together. They're just focused on different areas, but they they work together. They you know, absolutely. Right. And people are probably wondering how your kiddos, how's the family doing? We can see that you're doing well. How is your yeah. son? Um, You know, I think that uh, everybody has their own journey. And as a mother, I need to sit back and, um, you know, he's 15 now. And so just let him uh, kind of dictate the path. And my job is here to support and nurture and love. And, um, anytime he needs something, of course I'm here, but yeah, yeah. I know that's a very vague answer, but well, I have the similar, I mean, yeah, at 18, mine's 18. So yeah, some things have gotten a lot better and some things he still needs to, to work on. Cause he's not willing to do them. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. And I just remind myself, it took me until I was 40. Exactly. You know? Right. Right. And he's 15. I can't expect him to have, <laughs> have it all. Right. You right. know, yep. there's We're a process. All, all on our own journey. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. Well, I've absolutely loved talking to you. Um, you is there Kelly. anything else that you wanted to share that's really nurturing your body, mind, soul right now? Um. Mm-hmm. You know, I've started after reading some of Eileen McCusick's stuff, I really started to play around more with sound. Um, And so I bought some sound bowls and I've had tuning forks. And so we've been kind of playing around with those at the house. Mm -hmm. But really, you don't even have to do that. Like just going out at sunrise and all the bird song. And once you recognize that these pieces are healing, like just listening to birds is healing for your nervous system. That's right. Then when you go and do it, you can be like, "Ah." I am healing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And so it's pretty cool. Again, you know, I mean, I just think that follow your intuition, follow what your soul is calling you to do. And I think, you know, you can't really go wrong. Right. I agree. Well, thank you, Kelly. Yeah, thank you so much, Kelly. Anytime you want to come back, these are my favorite conversations to have. So I appreciate you being here. 